Welcome back. In the previous lecture, we talked through while and do while loops. I mentioned that there was another type of loop, a for loop. I can't wait to show you how this works. But first, let's quickly do a recap of what a loop does. At their most basic level, loops are pretty simple. They allow us to do something over and over again. In Apex, there are three basic types of loops: while, do while, and for loops. Both while and do while loops take a condition and loop through a piece of code until that condition is no longer true. But what makes for loops so special? For loops have a more compact syntax than while and do while loops. You can use for loops to iterate over a list or a set. You can even use for loops with socl. In fact, there are three different types of loops for each of these situations. Let's take a look. Type one: the traditional for loops. A traditional for loop is similar to both while and do while loops, but with a much more compact syntax. Referring to the Apex Developers Guide, the basic syntax of a traditional for loop looks like this: for initialize your loop variable, your loop's exit condition, and how to increment the loop variable. And within your flower braces, you have the code to loop over. A simpler version looks like this: for integer i equals zero, i less than three, i plus plus, and system dot debug i plus one. Let's take a closer look at this first line. Here's what we are doing: we have created a variable i as the integer data type and given it a value of zero. Then we have said that. As soon as the following condition is no longer true, stop looping. Then we have said that at the end of each loop, we'll increment the value of i by one. That's what the post increment operator i plus plus is doing. This basically gives us three iterations for the loop. We are testing this by outputting a line to our debug log during each loop. System dot debug i plus one. Let's run the entire code snippet. It's quite satisfying to see the following output in the debug log. Initially, i equals one, so zero plus one would be one. Then, i equals one, so one plus one equals two, and so on. Let me take a quick moment to talk about the post increment and decrement operators. Here, we are initializing x with a value of five. X plus plus is incrementing the value of x by one, and after the code runs. The value of x would be six. Similarly, we also have a post decrement operator. We initialize y with a value of five. Y minus minus is decrementing the value by one, and after the code runs, the value of y is four. Now let's see how this for loop compares to a while loop from a previous lecture. In this while loop, we are starting with an integer k and setting it to ten. With each pass through the loop. We're reducing that integer value by one using a post decrement operator. We can achieve the same thing with the traditional for loop, but with a slightly different, more concise, and I think better syntax. In this for loop, we are creating an integer variable k, representing the number of times we want the loop to run, and we also have a condition and a decrement operator. Both pieces of code do the same thing, but I think. For loop has a simple elegance that is missing from the while version, but this is really a coding style thing, and it's good to know both. I like using for loops because not only can you do a traditional for loop to loop over a condition, but you can also use for loops to loop over a list or a set, and combine this with using data collected from a SQL query. For loop using a list or a set. First, let's create our list that would hold some fruit. List string my fruit equals new list string apple mango orange and kiwi. This is how we populated our list in a lecture when we talked about collections. The basic structure of this kind of for loop looks like this: for variable type, variable name, and the list to loop over, and inside your flower braces. You have the piece of code. We have a collection of fruit called my fruit. Let's loop through this list 
and with each loop, we'll add an entry into our debug log. For string f, my fruit, system.debug, fruit in my list, plus f. So the variable data type is string, and f is the variable name, and my fruit is the list here. And with every iteration of the loop, we are trying to print out the fruit in the list. Running the list and the loop code together results in the following entries in our debug log. So we have all these fruits, apple, mango, orange, and kiwi. Let's try to make it more dynamic by combining this for loop with a Sockle query. I'm really excited now because this is the first time we have combined the superpower of Sockle with Apex. What we are attempting here is to create a list variable from a Sockle query and then loop over that list and change the data within the list and then use data manipulation language to post the updated data back to our Salesforce object. So imagine if you will the following scenario. We have added quite a few books to our custom book object but we realize that we want to add a new field and we want to record to whom that book is attributed to. No problem. I've added the lookup relationship field attributed to that ties back to the user object. But now we have all these books that have no attribution. Right now they should all be attributed to me. Doing this to make it convenient. As admins, we know that we export all the records, change them in Excel, and re import them. But I wanted to show you how this can be done using code. It's actually less work to do it with Apex and Sockle. We can first query the book records and store them in a list. Then loop through those books and update the attributed to field. Then we can use DML to update the records in the book object. First, let's look at the pseudocode. Create a list of books using Sockle query, loop through the list, and then set the attributed to field and then send this data as a batch up to Salesforce and update the book records. The great thing about starting with pseudocode is that we already have the beginning of our code comments. Code comments are awesome because, believe me, they make our future developer really happy. The worst thing in the world is to work hard on some code and then months later have to make a change and you have no idea what your code means. It's so much easier to comment as you go and save yourself some headaches. First. Let's create a list called books and feed all the records in our custom book object using a Sockle query for the ID, name, attributed to, from the book object. Now we need to loop through all the books. Using a for loop, we are looping through the list of books from the object book and we are calling each of this book with a variable b. Let's update the attributed to field to myself. This is the ID of my record in the user object. Let me also write a system.debug statement so that it captures the name of the book. Then a DML statement, update books. If you're curious why we put the DML statement outside our for loop, we'll talk about that later. As we know from the first loop code example, the basic syntax for using a for loop over a list looks like this. If we were to use this loop with our list of books, it would look like this. Book double underscore C is the S object and books is the list and B is the variable. We also saw earlier that we can loop over a list of strings, the fruit loop. So it's hopefully not too much of a stretch to loop over a list of S objects. In our case, the book records. Let's compare the two list loops. As you can hopefully see, they're pretty much the same. Just that one deals with a list of strings and the other deals with a list of S objects. In our case, book records. What about the stuff we put inside the loop? What does that do? If you're wondering about what this does, this sets the field attributed to for the record we are working with to my user ID. Using the system.debug statement, we are writing an entry into the debug log which book we just changed. Let's take a small detour to talk about Apex best practices. Don't put DML and Sockle inside a loop. 
Why? Because you'll soon come up against Salesforce governor limits. Making multiple Oracle queries and DML statements is inefficient. When we all share a common environment, like series of connected very very large infrastructure, we don't want to take up more resources than is necessary. To enforce good neighborly behavior, Salesforce limits us to 100 Oracle queries and 150 DML statements within a single transaction. If you are looping through many times, think like one loop per record, then you'll soon hit your governor limits and Salesforce will throw you some wonderful errors. For more information, check out the documentation related to running Apex within governor limits. Another best practice, optimize your Sockle for loop for large datasets. The problem is, when you're working with Sockle and your query returns a very large dataset, you may run up against the heap size limit. Don't worry about what this is right now, just know that it's not good and it'll throw an error. One solution to fix this is, we can change our Sockle for loop syntax and use a super compact version that looks like this. Since we want to make some changes to the data within our list, then we actually need to throw in a second inner loop in there to get that working. Check out this final code. First, create a compact Sockle for loop by creating a list variable called books to store book records. Then, Populate the list with the records from a Sockle query. Then, create a second for list loop that loops over the books list and updates the records within it. Lastly, use DML to update the book records in our custom book object. You might be thinking, doesn't this break rule number one, don't put DML inside our for loop? Kind of, but not really. The reason you shouldn't put DML inside a for loop is that you only want to run it once per transaction. In this example, we are only executing the DML once because we are doing all the transaction looping where we change the value within the list in an inner loop and the DML is in the outer loop which runs only once. You can see why we didn't start with this. A bit confusing, I know. But I wanted to at least alert you about some potential problems and show you an example of how to work around them. Also. This syntax has the added benefit of being super compact, which I'm partial to. You can find out more about this in the Salesforce developer docs, Sockle for loops and working with very large Sockle queries. And don't worry if you don't get this. It's not exactly the easiest thing to get. And you can always use the first way I showed you to work with Sockle and loops until you get comfortable. Now back to running our code. And click the execute button. I also want to make sure that the open log box is also checked. Cross your fingers. And we just updated all the books in our custom book object. Note that you get a lot of data along with your system.debug lines. So if you just want to look at them, check the debug only box at the bottom of your execution log. Let's take a look at my contact record and see what happened there. Yep, all the books are now attributed to me. Let's quickly summarize what we did. We did quite a lot in this class. We combined different force.com programming concepts from a bunch of different lectures, including loops, Sockle, collections, and DML. You should feel pretty proud. We learned that just as while and do while loops can loop over a collection, so can for loops, but with a slightly different and more compact syntax. We also learned a new way to create a list and how to populate it with static values that we define and dynamic values using Sockle. Then we learn how to loop through this list using a for loop to update the values within the list and then use DML to send the list up to Salesforce to update our Salesforce object. We also learned about some best practices to keep us out of trouble. In the next lecture, we'll talk about conditional statements.